Now, I think the interesting thing about this is to say, well, it is doing compression and it's doing a pretty good job. I mean, if you look at Lempel Ziv compressed text, it's almost routinely compressible down to, shall we say, 20% of its size by using techniques like this. Text is very compressible stuff because it's actually very, very predictable, as indeed Claude Shannon found out. What we are saying is, we're not introducing any probability model behind this about characters or about words. We're letting it, in a sense, establish its own probability model. Some of you may find this rather strange because if you refer back to a previous video you will now have seen, we covered the topic of how to devise a Huffman tree given a set of probabilities. And on the sheet of paper here, which Sean has available on his computer so it could always be inserted, you might protest and say, well, why not do it even better? Here are all the characters from A to Z. Let's presume our book or our text is all in lowercase, all in uppercase. So all we have to do is write down all 27 characters, find out how frequently they occur inside our book or our piece of text, here are the probabilities. They do all add up to one in the end, I assure you. And here, at great programming expense, I've actually worked out what the Huffman code would be for each of these characters. Notice that the most common character is the interword space gap, 0.18. Next most common is E, and then of course T, A, and so on. So based on those probabilities, my automated Huffman tree program has come out with this set of Huffman codes. Some of them, of course, are very short for common things. Some of them for things like say very, very long. So I say, well, surely if that's optimal in some sense, why not apply it to this? Why do it this way? Well, the answer is those are a perfectly good set of probabilities if only when you're reading, you read one character at a time but you don't. You group characters into sequences and these probabilities alter dramatically when you get sequences of characters. I think one of my favourite illustrations of this, which I can give you from here, is of how, if you like, relative probabilities are. According to this table here, the probability of encountering the letter U is 0.0228. In other words, it's 2.3% probable to occur. However, in English, what you can also say, those of you who've done probabilities will know this notation. I'll say it very slowly for those who aren't so familiar. The probability of seeing a U in general in arbitrary text is 2.3%. But what is the probability of seeing a U given that you've just seen a Q? And the answer is, certainly in English, I would say, I think Sean and I both agree on this, well greater than 99%. There are very, very few words in English where you just get a Q on its own, not followed by a U. There's some examples, of course. Brady will know one of these very well. Acronyms, Qantas, Queensland and Northern Territories Air Service, a lone Q without a U. Names of countries, Iraq. But apart from country names, acronyms, abbreviations, you do not get many Qs that aren't followed by a U. Is that QI for those Scrabble enthusiasts? What? Oh, what does QI mean? Uh, I actually don't know what it means. Ah. It's a two-letter valid word in Scrabble. Though. All right. We'll allow QI occasionally. Scrabble. The Scrabble dictionary has got it. But I think the point should be clear. It's all constantly shifting sands, these probabilities. You can't say that those uh, character probabilities are absolute in any sense. They shift about all over the place, depending on the structure of the words. And even more deadly is the fact that we, as humans, regard our probabilities in word units, not in character units. And all the time, the probability of something happening is very, very strongly related to what has gone previously. In fact, we were discussing, Sean and I, just recently, 
Consider the phrase, one of Elvis's first records was Don't You Step On My Blue Suede and with probability 99.999% the next word is shoes. This happens all the time. Um, the surprise factor, if you like, in natural languages and in English is not very high indeed. So, things like the Lempel-Ziv method build on that. They don't say, oh, we'll take some pre-given set of probabilities, not even for words. What it says is, we will implicitly establish our own probabilities by seeing how often certain strings keep occurring inside this file. And if they occur a lot, you will find lots and lots of back pointers to commonly occurring words. So in a sense, what it's saying implicitly is that the combination C-O-M-P-U-T-E-R occurs again and again and again and again in this particular document, but it might not occur, for example, nearly so often in something like a Charles Dickens novel. So there's huge flexibility to be gained by letting the compressor either explicitly or implicitly find out the statistics of the occurrence as it goes along in what's sometimes called generally adaptive compression models. You might want to also look up one of the ultimate techniques in adaptive compression called arithmetic compression and that is a huge topic in its own right. The probabilities may not be what they first seem and if you say to me what's the secret behind information theory and compression the answer is all the time probabilities, 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 the three P's. Um, getting your probability model right for the material you are coping with is the heart of getting a really successful compression. So all the time you have to be prepared to be adaptive and even a little bit pragmatic because many compression methods will say hmm if I were to do a two-pass process on this look at the statistics really learn about them then come back and then do the compression I could get a few percent better result than just trying to compress it as I go along. Do you want me to do that? And my reply would be, well, if you're going to take an extra half hour to compress it and decompress it, I'm not interested. I'd sooner have a sort of 95% OK compression that's quick to decompress. And the great thing about Lempel-Ziv is it is fast to decompress. And that really, really matters.